right, well, welcome. And I think we, we can start things off here. So thank you for joining us on this Monday, mo Monday morning, I guess at noon, depending on where you're calling in from either morning or evening. Uh, and my name is Robbie Nock, and I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Professional Practice here at Art Center. And we are very, very glad you are joining us for this session on everyone, the rebrand of the rebrand. As many of you know, this is part of our bold series at Art Center, our platform and programming for creative entrepreneurs. And we are proud to partner with the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography to host this uh, dynamic two-part webinar event. So our, our session, as, as you saw in the invitation, will be divided over the, the course of two one and a half hour uh, engagements. We will start today with the introduction and, and case study in EO products and everyone brands. And then on Monday next week, we will have a, a deep dive into the actual tactics and process of the rebranding strategy that you're gonna learn about. So overall, our, our goal today is to really help you understand how the rebranding process isn't just a communications tool or a logo or, or a kind of a, a design tool in, in the visual way, but it's actually a, a strategy to really rethink an entire product, a market, and a, and a group of um, it, you know, resources around your customer and community. Uh, the process that everyone has gone through is unbelievable and is something that uh, can be applied to lots of different brands and organizations. So uh, at, at its core, the art of rebranding orchestrates a complex process between brand, business, manufacturing, and community. Communities of, of employees, communities of customers, communities of, of stakeholders and, and participants in a, a brand and an organization. And uh, th the focus really today is helping you see how the visual side connects to the, the impact side, how environmental responsibility and social impact are, are deeply tied to um, graphic and, and brand communication. Uh, so our, our incredible guest today and the, and the reason we're able to have this conversation is uh, Susan Griffin Black and she is the founder and co-CEO of the uh, brand called EO Products. And they have been uh, in the, the beauty and wellness space for the last 25 years uh, with a sub-brand called Everyone, which many are familiar with um, in, in stores like Target and Whole Foods and you, you name it. Uh, it, it is a, in a lot of homes and a lot of spaces. And Susan started EO over 25 years ago and, and she's really a maker at core. She's, she was very, very deeply connected to the ingredients and the process of manufacturing the original um, essential oils, uh, which, which were part of the EO products heritage and, and, and founding. And since then has built an profitable, sustainable and, and really remarkable company. Um, and she has grown that herself with an incredible community of partners and collaborators along the way. Joining Susan will be Jose Caballer, who many of you know from bold, bold programming in the past. Jose worked with Susan and EO Products and the Everyone team to really help implement the, the rebranding process, to bring together all of the capabilities and, and resources and knowledge bases that were needed to really implement this remarkable, remarkable pathway. Uh, Jose is also an entrepreneur and a strategist and creative visionary. He started his career in the agency world, moved into online education, has been involved in different technology and, and brand strategy projects around the world, uh, and, and really is leading that uh, 21st century brand transformation process. Beyond Jose and Susan, we also have an incredible guest who is really our host, Gloria Condrup. Gloria is the executive director of the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography. She's a professor at Art Center. She's an alum of Art Center. And she really is an educational leader in this space. In 1993, she did her thesis at Art Center on the connection between design and sustainability, particularly with a focus on product design and packaging. She since has then implemented that thinking into 
her classroom and her practice and her professional career, consulting with and working with brands and organizations and businesses in many different spaces at many different scales and really ensuring that these impact metrics that sustainability, responsibility uh, and, and community engagement are connected to business outcomes. Uh, Gloria is um, a, a great friend and a, and a great leader in this space and she will be leading the moderated Q&A portion of, of today's event. So I'm just gonna run you very quickly through the, the timeline for the next uh, hour and a half and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump right into it. So we'll start with a, a brief introduction that, uh, for, from Susan's perspective on EO products and everyone as the, as the founder of that organization. We'll then do a very, very quick rapid fire assessment of the rebranding process where you'll get to see some, uh, some uh, examples of, of what the team went through, how they were thinking, how they made changes, how they worked together and collaborated. Uh, and then we'll, we will work through a, a list of predetermined questions that we really want to highlight before then concluding with the last 30 minutes for audience Q&A. Uh, please connect with each other on the chat. We really, we want you to feel like this is a dynamic uh, uh, conversation and experience, but please put your questions in the Q&A. We will tr do our best to keep track of everything in the chat, but for the questions at the, in the Q&A at the end, put them right in there as soon as you have them. And if we can address those questions before we reach the final 30 minutes, we will do so. So, uh, and then you'll, you'll be hearing from us on the follow-up uh, session next Monday. So stay tuned afterwards. Uh, we are grateful for you being here. And with that, I'd like to leave it to Susan to share her vision for EO products and, and the, the founding of that company and, and uh, path that she has been on as an entrepreneur. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, and so delighted, really, and, and it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, the short story, I think, that I, I wanna say, <clears throat> excuse me, is we were doing EO, and we were makers. EO stands for Essential Oils. It was founded in 95, really in the Bloomingdale's Holiday Catalog. And at the time we were using originally cobalt glass bottles. And then we migrated as we, as categories and products grew in, in terms of selection into uh, PCR plastic first at 50% and eventually at 100%. We didn't make a big deal about it because we were um, <clears throat> committed to sustainability and really doing no harm was our aspiration. Um, you know, all manufacturers, just being a maker, you're, you're trying, I mean, for us, it was a matter of mitigating the damage that we're doing to the environment and really formulating with these beautiful plant-based ingredients that we then wanted to put in bottles that met the same standards. So it was minimal packaging, you know, very sort of type driven, minimal aesthetic that went into na the natural product stores. We grew up in Whole Foods and we were very different from everything else that was on the shelf. So that business grew organically. We transformed from, you know, being a maker of a few products to buying a private label manufacturer in 99 and kept going. In 2012, we realized two things. One is Whole Foods wanted us to develop a more value-driven um, product line, just a few key products. And my son came home with his band and they were, I was picking up towels in the bathroom and looking around at uh, all of the products that they had. And I was, you know, shocked and dismayed and had to call an immediate focus group. And they were like, mama, you know, EO's too expensive. There's not enough product in there. We need more of an all-in-one product. And so everyone with those two forces of what Whole Foods wanted and what Mark and his band were saying was sort of the beginning. And so we purpose, we, it, we had such a commitment to 
creating a value product with the same standards that we were making our higher price products. So if we couldn't use an expensive essential oil, that was okay. We designed into what we could use to make a better for you product. And with that, we sort of, when we were looking around for our initial packaging and we knew it was gonna be 32 ounces for 9.99 and we were doing a three-in-one soap and a three-in-one lotion, it was clear to us that we would use stock packaging and to really convey the idea of accessibility and really bold type with color to differentiate the categories. We started with six SKUs at the end of 2012, shipped them into Whole Foods globally, and it was sort of an immediate success and then ramp, which we thought we were prepared for, but we actually weren't. And so there was a lot of chasing. And then when we started to look at the uh, PCR content in the packaging, it was you know about 50% and we could never get it to 100% because of the, it made the bottle look gray. <clears throat> Excuse me, as we branched out into <clears throat> big box stores, the packaging was not as well received as it was with our core group of customers. They thought it looked generic. We started doing consumer insight testing at that time and the feedback was, it looks generic. It looks like a house brand. We don't really get it. You know, they didn't really think it was as cool as we did with our core community and group of customers. So we knew we had to rebrand. And for a couple of years, we thought about it uh, in the label. And then when Jose came on board, it really expanded our, our look and our uh, approach and dialogue. And we started looking at what other possible packaging would be that was in line with not only our aesthetic, but would, uh, an idea, our idea was to elevate the brand, make it a real brand because, you know, it was into to really have a wider appeal. And, um, and that's, that's what we did. And as you'll see, as we go, the, um, the results aren't in yet because it's not in the market yet, but we feel so excited and so grateful. And it's been just a beautiful thing all working together. Thank you, Susan. I think that's uh, my cue to, to share a little bit of the story and uh, continue that story. Um, so the results aren't in because it's not in the market yet, but there's still a lot of momentum around the rebrand as a whole uh, across all the different channels or across uh, the different components of the brand. And I'm going to tell the story in a movie form very quickly, um, just so that everyone gets a bit of an idea. Um, super awesome to be here. Thank you, uh, Robbie, for coordinating this. And Gloria, as uh, my teacher um, and an amazing uh, human being for hosting and, and having this dialogue with Susan and I. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to go into it really quick. So everyone, the rebrand of the rebrand. Um, and the challenge really was evolving and elevating the everyone brand in a mindful way uh, that accounts for people, culture, and process. Um, 25 years, like Susan said, uh, B Corp, which means, you know, uh, benefit corporation, mission-driven, two brands, EO and everyone, and available at, you know, major retailers. Uh, for me, Brad and Susan almost represent like the next generation of leaders in the sustainability space or in the entrepreneurial space that, that, that have uh, this mindset. So there's uh, Patagonia and even Chouinard, but I think that they're really taking that mantle forward and, and uh, as a student body and alumni, we should all be super aware of who they are. Uh, so these are the two brands um, that uh, exist under the EO products uh, moniker. Uh, everyone on the right, and EO as they are today. Um, beautiful factory in San Rafael, uh, California. Uh, the journey started last October, uh, the uh, 2019, uh, pre-COVID uh, with Discovery all the way through um, very recently, about a month and a half ago. Uh, but we're really gonna tell the story today 
uh, of about March, April, May, right into the midsummer um, or into the spring. Um, and next week we'll tell more of the continued uh, story on a more technical uh, basis in terms of process. But the beginning really was about creating a brand studio. And it wasn't necessarily about doing a rebrand uh, for everyone or for EO or for the products. It was really creating um, a new kind of entity inside the company, physical space, effective branded collaboration, uh, bringing everybody to the table. The idea that you know one of the challenges in most companies is the gap the gaps between creative product marketing, the founders, uh, and working with founders, it's a very unique uh, skill set uh, and something that I've learned a lot from this engagement. And getting everybody from going from multiple views into one view, uh, or at least an agreement and alignment, and reducing really narrowing the corridor to decrease the risk and the interaction costs and the pain sometimes suffered. So there's really three steps. Uh, Tom Fiegel, who's the president of uh, EO Products, who asked me uh, to come help, um, and I uh, worked on this and, and, and kind of negotiating what the process would be. Brand alignment, working on the creative, and really setting up the brand studio were the real things. Bringing together product, marketing, creative into one roof. Um, and uh, that was envisioned a bit, like what would it look like? Um, and that was in mid-October, and you'll see what it looked like by the beginning of November when we landed in San Rafael. So really aligning the, the brand, the customers, and the goals, uh, explaining a bit like what the process would look like, uh, prioritizing with Tom, like what are the top you know, three things that need to be done, and then the rest of the things in general. And then really working here uh, with uh, Jeff Silva, who I will share a little bit about that journey a bit more. Jeff's also an alum. Uh, three alum, many alum worked on this, but a really amazing team. And I'll give shout outs to everybody as, as we go through this. So discovery was the first step, landing uh, in San Rafael, looking through all of the different parts where you can actually find the products, doing a lot of shopping, walking around, mill, uh, uh, um, San Rafael and uh, Mill Valley. And there's Jeff, uh, I think he had the same knee highs as our waitress at a restaurant. So it was pretty awesome. Uh, buying immediately, this was the first few days of being there. And by the first day or by the first three days, we already were starting to set up, starting to talk to everyone, starting to find out where the brand comes from and the legacy, really doing archeological digging understanding the breadth and scope of the products. And then at the end of the week, we went to a uh, happy hour and, and got to know the team at large. And then the following week, we really began brand alignment, really understanding the brand, understanding the product architecture with all the people in the room that are involved, you know, everyone from product uh, to the founders, et cetera. And then documenting that bringing it into our, uh, the copy room where we were setting up at the beginning uh, to stage and then beginning to document that and uh, summarize it and read it back to everybody and confirm what the priorities were, what the goals were, but this was from the people. It wasn't necessarily being given by one or uh, two people. It was from everyone. Translating the brand attributes uh, into what those things might mean to everyone um, this one being somewhat important uh, in the idea of creating a movement and, you know, the whole earth catalog and, you know, all these different things that you can um, associate with movement. Then des design divergence, um, really doing a lot of work uh, to showcase ideas and options. Um, much had been done before in the previous two years, and we built upon that and really just wanted to let everyone see all the different options. Greg Lindy, who teaches at Art Center um, uh, Typography, uh, was uh, helped us um, on the redesign of the logo mark. Uh, and then Content BK, Jeff Silva, Amy, who both are on this call, and Jeff will be next week on our session. They did an amazing job at beginning to manifest some of the ideas, many ideas. We're just showing a few highlights here. 
uh, to get the team excited uh, and show what the possibilities were and then get feedback. So we went through very Socratic, imagine crits at Art Center and had everybody give feedback, give input and even vote on what they liked. And we were paying attention to everything that came back. Um, doing validation, uh, which meant doing customer focus groups. And this was the first customer focus group that was done internally uh, with the guidance of Content BK. Um, we were able to do the scripting and with the guidance of the product team and set it up and then have the folks watch it live via Zoom from another room, which was really amazing if you got to watch what the people were actually saying about the three directions. And the three directions were just the beginning. They were a stab uh, and then really continuing to show the rest of the company and include more people in the culture uh, kind of evolving to uh, include design and the brand studio team. There was a moment though, and Robbie asked this question last week where we didn't know where we were gonna land and, and Susan didn't feel like we were um, getting somewhere. Um, well, well, there wasn't something special. I think it, it was a challenge at that point. And she texted me, what do you think about Amber? Which I'm sure she had been thinking about for a long time. And uh, I sent it to Jeff. Jeff kind of came up with a few things real quickly on Amber, which is um, an Amber bottle. And I, by mistake, took the label off. And I said, mm -hmm. wow, this looks very interesting. And I, this is the exact screenshot that I sent to Susan and said, here we go. Amber. And she got really excited. And the next morning it was in the all hands presentation. So that was really the solution to maybe something that there was a wish or a desire. A lot of the other things were very technical, like the condensed font for the logo mark, kind of expanding it and making it more um, geometric, which was a very functional thing. And we'll talk about it next week. But then really things started moving very fast after that, because we had Expo West, which is the <clears throat> biggest natural trade show. And there was a lot of work to do in a month to get ready for Expo West, including beginning to prototype the bottles in whatever form possible uh, to take them to Expo West. Uh, so this is the first uh, vision of the redesign mm -hmm. post uh, the early Max, who is a longtime employee and an amazing creative and just hauled through putting all this together in like a week. Um, and we really began to everything from trade show booth, um, the poster concept for movement, you can see it here, which it evolved from that. And really the physical space was created uh, where the marketing team used to work. We just cleared it, uh, rearranged furniture, bought the boards and really had that become our kind of like art center style crit space and project management and everything was done from there. And uh, that's where we also had our parties at the end of every month. <clears throat> you want to say something, Susan? <clears throat> I do. I think, um, you know, I was pretty resistant to changing the packaging in the beginning and really all the way through because it was such a big commitment financially and otherwise. And um, <clears throat> part of me was we're doing so well. How much can we change it without alienating our current customers? <clears throat> and I, when Amber came to me, I, I was like, Oof, you know, yikes. If we really do it, you know, that's quite a commitment. And so I, I had a vision of Amber and I told it to Jose. Then he made it real with the team. And it was clearly the, the right direction, I think, to all of us. And then we just had to go. And... And, and then we did, you know, we've done a lot of testing <clears throat> to verify, but, you know, um, let's see, it's been an eight month process so far and um, we will launch in uh, January. In January, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think that the interesting thing, and for me, you know, understanding the process of co-creation and that, and that it, it, all the input has come from so many different people, from the legacy, from the customers themselves. Um, and these are from the last qualitative testing that was done and some of the results, you know, people really were uh, funny about their comments and their feedback. 
but everything always landed in the middle and we kind of designed it to be that way, which is like, here's an extreme, here's an extreme, here's kind of like where we're trying to aim it. Um, and, you know, so what does the final design look like? You know, we can't show it yet, but we can uh, do a top secret preview, you know, maybe a little bit covered and like unveil it for a little bit. I don't know if that was fast enough. See how fast you can, but please don't share or screen shoot or um, the most important thing I think, aside from that quick top secret preview, uh, it's a human connection part. For me personally, this was really an exercise in how do you uh, go beyond being a graphic designer and being a leader of people and an integrator of uh, alignment was spelled wrong. Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> being a leader of, and recognizing your mistakes, being a leader in general of, of the process of that, and also all the people that were involved, because really ultimately, Tom was the, the, the person who brought us in, you know, contributions from the team, Brad, one of the founders. What I, the reason I wanted to show these images in the human connection, in addition to design, in addition to dealing with that, is how do you design the teams? How do you design the process? How do you design the people? As people, when people left, you know, I had them do, a presentation of what they, they, their advice to the company, also their top three projects over the last few years. And a few people left during the eight months, you know, that, that, uh, that I was there uh, helping with the rebrand. And it was amazing to listen to the stories and you learned a lot about what, you know, the knowledge, the, the collective knowledge that there is in the company um, and a lot of crying, which I really love. Um, mm. Once COVID happens, we all went remote. So we really had to start really practicing uh, and there was a lot of rituals and a lot of ideas uh, that we worked with. And uh, Mary Gribben, who's on this call, uh, Jeff, Amy, uh, there were so many people involved um, in addition to how amazing Susan uh, is and, and her ability to kind of lead uh, through difficult times. Um, and this is the final picture, uh, which is super funny because uh, I just added it, uh, of Brad and Susan and me, because I painted my nails to, ma to match the packaging. Um, mm -hmm. The first step towards change is total awareness of the possible. Uh, and the key themes that I'll leave Gloria with are these, but Susan, go ahead. Well, no, I was, uh, I was gonna say that one hand was blue, cobalt, and the other, and the other hand was amber. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. That's when we knew and we were moving forward. That was a ritual of like, all right. We're That's right. And I just wanna say that, you know, working with Jose and Jeff and Amy and, was such a such a privilege really and such wonderful people and so open and curious and progressive and it was um, it was a beautiful thing and still continues to be a beautiful thing to to have these relationships and and all of you in our lives so thank you thank you thank you well thank you I, I think I want to take credit <laughs> a little bit, Please for Jose. Do. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, first, <clears throat> I want to say um, thank you, Susan, for doing this. Now, Susan and I have had a conversation about when we started this back, mm -hmm. our our interest in trying to change the world from a, I would say, a creative point of view to a maker point of view. Susan and I are not engineers. You know, we are. Um, people who are concerned about the future of our world, our social responsibility, the ethics by which we work. And, and when Jose, I'll say this quick, Jose was my student, he would say, what, what is she talking about? Why should I be concerned about all of this? I mean, it was alien to any student in uh, you know, 1996 to say that this is an important issue that should be integrated in your design just as much as your typography, your color, you know, all of what you put or what you design in a package really communicates to your consumer, your ethics, your philosophy, you know, how you want to be perceived, what is your mission? And I, and I think Susan, you've done it in such a beautiful way without putting a flower or a little sprig. You know, mm. I, I think the world has finally caught up to you mm. in understanding the visual language of sustainability 
is very sophisticated. It has to be clear. It should be clear. It should be approachable, approachable definitely. And I think that's what we always need to stress is that the importance of how we communicate on any product and the authenticity by which you communicate it, which is what you do, because your product is really reflective of your own company's approach to life, to business. And I think that's extremely important for everyone to understand that uh, everyone and everyone products and EO products are reflective of your philosophy. In fact, you had a, an interview in 2018 with the New York Times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on the origin of EO products. And uh, you shared, uh, we just knew the ingredients we didn't want to use. And you said your own experience led the way from more than the marketplace. Um, so I assume, how does this, did this philosophy mm -hmm. and your vision must, must mm -hmm. have led to the implementation of the rebranding process? Did this lead the rebranding process? Yes, I think um, one of the things was always because I wasn't, you know, from the fragrance industry and because our orientate, my orientation was really from the clothing business. I was a merchandiser and designer at Esprit. Right. And we started asking about, you know, we talked about this or where does, you know, just the- Where does um, it come from, right? Right, implication of, you know, growing cotton and how much <clears throat> land it takes, how toxic it is, how toxic it is to, the earth and also the people who are harvesting and processing. So the connection between um, ingredients and how they come to us and mixing ingredients and then how you package it and then how you're uh, working with people and how you're working with suppliers and customers and your bank and so forth. So the idea at, uh, was to have an integrated company that we would want to work for and so the development, brand development and product development was really from the inside out. And we always had in-house creative because we wanted to, and we manufactured. So it was a, a vertical way and an inside out way of looking at the, the, uh, 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 being a maker. Right, um, right, right, right. So that just always has flowed and continued. And the, the downside of that is, you know, we weren't marketers and we mm -hmm. ran through marketing people in some ways <laughs> because we always felt like they didn't get us. Right, <clears throat> right. So I, I think we have the, you know, the first marketing, um, uh, the first successful CMO. marketing yeah. team well, you know, right. with, with Maya, because she, and with Tom, who is our president, he's our CEO now, but he joined us about a little over a year ago. And that's been so successful. And I feel so thankful for his insight. And also he's not a conventional CEO. He's, right. he, he really at, at heart is a brand guy and really understands what our maker vision has been. And he could take that and, you know, with his um, connections and network, bring it in so that we were able to accelerate and up level and, you know, um, create this momentum with Jose and team to really keep following our vision and integrate everything else that we were doing. And one of the things in the rebrand is the beauty of Amber was also um, that it's 100% PCR as well. And, and, and then, right. yeah, so, you know, that was getting there was very important because we've been a zero waste and organic manufacturing facility. And we also, because we make hand sanitizer are, um, you know, FDA approved. So th there are a lot of, um, practical things right. in, you know, selecting packaging and integrating all of this, forget getting to the customer side of inventory. I'm just saying internally. And 
it's a beautiful thing to be vertical and it's also yikes you know to <laughs> to <laughs> to not be able to shift that responsibility outside makes us ever more conscious of what we're not doing well you know because we can right. see I, everything and, and i think and, and that leads to the next question by the way i just wanted to explain uh pcr to those in the oh, audience sorry. who might post yeah, it's post please do yes <laughs> yeah i just realized you know we're so we're so comfortable with these terms mm. that yeah. um some people might not be comfortable mm. with uh, post-consumer recycles and that's mm -hmm. very interesting when you close the cradle to grave circle. You're not creating something that gets thrown out. You're really reusing something that's already been reused again. So that's for everyone to understand what that means. And this leads us to an, another, it's interesting, you know, it's so complex. People do not understand that when you rebrand, right? And you change one item, that amber bottle, sets a chain reaction when you were talking about the complexities, not just changing a label is one thing, changing a bottle, right? Was, I'm sure, did it drive your people mm -hmm. crazy? You have to re-gear up. You have to retool for all of this. You have to think to yourself. Still, yes. You're mm -hmm. still. Yeah, yeah because you know, we manufacture in Southern, we are bottle manufacturers in Southern California. And so they are able to, with curbside pickup, you know, they're, the plastic that they're reusing is local. And, and we purposefully mm. look for that versus ocean, you know, ocean bound plastic, which is different because then you have to gather it from, <clears throat> you know, Thailand or um, other places and then ship it here. So what we're trying to do, you know, from a uh, regenerative and resilient point of view is to shorten all of those distances so that we're reusing and that we're not creating any new plastic. So that in and of itself is an issue. Plus we had to have molds made for sizes because they didn't necessarily come in amber PCR. And we have five different packages. So that coordination, you know, turned into a, you know, task force of 20 people that have come together that we meet once a week or once every other week to ensure that we're, we're moving at, the, at a right. similar pace anyway, to actually make it happen. And, and, you know, it's expensive. It's very, you yeah. know, yeah. That, and, and, and it's, and it's, it's, these are decisions, you know, that you are, you have made these clear ethical decisions that you're going to use a local state manufacturer for you. You're going to collect, you know, plastics locally. You're, you really, focus on how you clearly communicate. These are very difficult, you know, decisions that you, I don't think most people understand. You have to balance this with the cost, time and competition. Yet you've been able to maintain this for, how do you maintain for 25 years? Mm -hmm. Have you gotten, have you ever been tempted? Not so tempted. But have you ever reached a point where you're saying, okay, I, if I do it this way, it'll be easier. It'll be more cost effective. Those are kind of, have you ever, I'm sure, been at points where maybe you should relax a little? Your ethics. Yes. Yes. I was like, you know, I, you know, a competitor would come out and instead of the, the first ingredient being deionized water, they would make it organic aloe. So you think that there's not water in the product, but the trick is, is you put a little aloe concentrate in the water and then you can call it that first ingredient aloe. aloe, or, you know, just put organics in the name. And so EO, which no one ever knew that it stood for essential oils, even, you know, in, in all of this time, practically they, they think of us as 
the Blue Bottle Company. Oh yeah, I know that brand. And hmm. so if we would have made it, you know, essential organics, we could have skirted that issue. So, so many of those decisions along the way when, you know, uh, but you know, it does really come down to morals and ethics and, and who you are and mm -hmm. how you wanna live, right? I mean, right. I'll give you a very sort of off example, which is this. When I was in college, I went to Penn State, I have a liberal arts degree. My um, roommate was a, ended up being a drug dealer and I was going to school and working as a cocktail waitress, you know? And I thought, God, she's making, that would have been, that's so much easier. <laughs> and I thought about it, right? And I really, I was like, you know, and I couldn't do it. And I couldn't do it, not because of, you know, that I thought I had a big judgment about it. It was just for myself. I, I, I didn't want to make money that way. It just didn't line up for me. And so it was, it, it became clear to me in those moments that you could go, you know, at that fork in the road, who are you? What do you stand for? What are your values? What do you want to express in the world? And as tempting as it is sometimes to, you know, take that detour, there's, there's a cost to everything. There's no free lunch, you know? So if, and, and so that just has always stayed with me for, you know, and I could think of those markers, you know, throughout my life where, you know, is that the next right thing? Mm. And, and, and I think it's very relevant. I mean, especially today with what we see in the world, how the world has shifted, you know, 25 mm. years ago, you know, people would say, oh, why are you doing this? And stay in the course, I think you're gonna find that, uh, you know, the leadership of the world in terms of business will be those who did take into consideration, what is the value of this to humans? What is the value of this to our environment? Which we sometimes forget, but you have not forgotten. We are part of it as humans. We're not separated, everything we use. And what I'm really fascinated, and, and you can probably, um, you be honest about Jose and uh, his work. Were you surprised at all um, by how he was able to communicate your vision for the environmental and social impact through his his design? I mean, I'm I'm very I'm I'm a, like a proud mother because mm. he he did a fabulous job communicating your concepts, your ethics your impact through communication, through the use of color, the correct use of typography. Again, were you a little bit like, wow, this is, this is going to work? I... Well, the funny part is that I didn't do any of that. <clears throat> <laughs> well, wait. I, I, the work was done by other people. <laughs> But you, facil you facilitated. You facilitated. You, you facilitated. You, okay, the work by Jeff and the other. But how did you respond to mm -hmm. all of this visual communication and the typography and, and the importance and the nuances of how you, I mean, there's a lot of nuance. I'm sorry we can't show the package. Be we have to wait. Um, mm -hmm. Because the nuances, your choices of understanding, choose this versus that. It must have been really interesting for you. You know, it was so, it was interesting and it was so great because I knew <clears throat> from our initial meeting that we had the same reference points. And when we didn't, Jose right. really understood mine, you know? And so that if we said, oh, you know, Tibor Kalman or Roscoe or Albert's right. or, you know, and had color references and, and he's, you know, he's a pro Jose, and, he's a, and, you know, it was, it was a constant dialogue. Jose, can you go back to the image that had showed the, the first rebrand from the blue bottles? Remember, and you put them side to side, it was a few slides before this one, because I right. think it's interesting for people to understand mm -hmm. 
I think before this, you know, when you had the old one, the old uh, everyone product, and then maybe it's forward. Okay, I could be. Yeah, I mean, when you look at, I think number one, it shows how your customer has changed too. When mm -hmm. you first did this, you had to explain to everyone, what does our brand mean to you? So there was a lot of words, a lot of essential, you know, you had to explain. But now when you look at it, as you developed your product, I think your customer's gotten smarter too. We, yeah, this is the one, Jose. Yes. Where you look at this and you can say, okay, I know I have educated my customer. And, and that's what was important to you. You've educated your customer. You've educated your, your employees with mm -hmm. the original. But now that people are educated about the authenticity of everyone, products and essential oils, you can now encapsulate that, which makes it far more difficult for the designer to get it right mm. with less. Yes, and also, how do you depart from the essence of what people liked about it, which was right. readability, accessibility, you know, there were some good things there, and and not abandon the accessibility and um, mm -hmm. maker part of it, and also just the natural piece, you know, of right. uh, when you look at it, it, does it feel like it's natural? And does it feel like mm -hmm. it's, you know, a better for you product? And the market has met us and we've met the market and right. evolved <clears throat> from that relationship. You know, and, and, and I guess the question is, were there any compromises you had to make in order to achieve your goal? Were there any compromises in order to achieve your goal? Whether it's economic, budget, time, were there many compromises or no? You just made sure there were none. Well, um, I would say not much, you know, okay. because we, because it, it's not like let's start from scratch and make a custom bottle. I've never been, you know, so charged up about custom packaging because then to, from the practical financial side, um, to amortize that, you have to have much bigger distribution. And that's a, you know, if this was a one year process that could be a two to three year process. So mm -hmm. we haven't really executed on that or really thought about that as much as how do you modify what's already there and how do you design into that? So I would say that we we didn't we uh, I don't feel like we had to compromise. Yeah, I, and I and, and I think that's what what I was going to add to that. Um, you know, Susan has a lot of experience uh, over the last twenty five years in EO products, though mm -hmm. compared to some of the other category mm -hmm. leaders, is a small company. Even though for us we would you know, talk about the revenue and say, well, that's a fairly big company. Uh, but, it, and it's also family owned and it's, mm -hmm. and it's, um, I think that the designer having the nuanced ability to understand the business dynamics and the operational challenges that every decision that you make uh, brings to the table, it's important. Uh, Jeff Silva, one of the first things that I asked him to do for <clears> myself, <throat> this is the first time I've ever done a packaging product or a packaging project since Art Center, because I was in digital for 20 years. And like you said about your class, I was like, uh, um, I actually enjoyed, <laughs> I enjoyed I enjoyed you, Gloria. It wasn't, it wasn't, I, I enjoyed you and I enjoyed the you, ideas of, uh, the aesthetics of like ecological design. <laughs> anyway, but the point was that you really have to understand all of the different influences that are gonna really, uh, come into it. So I really counted and depended on the team and facilitated every single person and listening, understanding product, really understanding uh, Susan, understanding Brad, uh, the other co-founder, understanding Tom. Your job is basically to listen to all these people and like synthesize that. You're a saint. Let me just say that. Because 
to have to listen and coordinate all of that information. And then also Jeff and Amy are amazing designers and they were both uh, with Johnson and Johnson. And so they had best practices for a global company that really they taught us, they presented in such a way that there was sensitivity and choice and understanding about packaging. And, you know, the <clears throat> because we are not, um, <clears throat> we have no private equity or venture money. Um, we live in a sort of a different, with different parameters because we don't have that overarching, um, uh, the overarching- Shareholder concern, yeah. And in, well, institutionalized greed, yeah, institutionalized. you know, to, you know, <laughs> it, it, it call, just- Call it out, yeah. Yeah. Call it out, it's, it's true. Yeah, it is. And so, you know, uh, even the best of them, it's still the model is institutionalized greed. So that also makes us, you know, um, a little bit more, you know, agile and scrappy in a certain way. But, you know, at this size, and the interesting thing about scaling was, you know, if a vendor says, you know, I don't think we can do that much, you know, if we, we really want to do 50% PCR, it's too hard to do, da, da, da. Now we have the volume that makes a difference in the marketplace. So we can say, well, you know, it's either a hundred percent or, or, you know, so it pushes our suppliers, I think in the best way and makes us all accountable to each other and related to each other so that we're all doing this work together. And so we choose who we're doing business with, with whether right. it's a supplier or our bank sort of in a, in a similar way so that we're cultivating the same values and relationships. And, and, and I think that's very important to point out, you know, as you can have a vision and it's very interesting having a, a vision or a certain amount of ethics and as, as we, we say, and I think it's very important in education for young designers, you must decide what is your ethical fabric. And it has to do with what you do, Susan, you're working with certain vendors, you're making these choices. I think you have the right to ask what is your ethical viewpoint with vendors? And you and Susan, you've been great by saying, no, we, we work with you because you support our brand. And the brand to you is, the, is, is internal. It's almost like the inside of your body brand, right? You can't, your brand is not a package on a shelf. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. Your brand, uh, people have to understand the holistic quality of your brand deals with community, the respect that you have for your employees, the respect that you have for your consumer. And I think it's very, very, very difficult for most people to understand the depth of your brand that has such an effect, you know, globally, will have an effect globally. Um, it, did anything surprise you about the rebranding process? Did something hit you besides the amber bottle? But something else say, oh, well, <clears throat> well, that's important. And I didn't realize that. Uh, yes, I think it, you know, we're just really um, uh, getting in the groove of consumer insights. Our consumer insights were all, were really like, you know, I have a gut feeling about this. And the focus group was very internal with about 20 people. And that was that, you know? And so in this world of consumer insights, it's very uh, interesting to really take in what people have to say, even if I don't like it or I don't like to yeah. hear it or, and when we're all listening together as a team, it becomes less personal. And so yeah. if you're your own customer, if you start by being your own customer, and that is the easiest and most authentic place to start. It's like, if I like it and my sister likes it and you know, my aunt and my friends and community like it and it sort of starts rippling out like that, that's a very different place and a very different place to start than 
where we started with this rebrand, which was what does the marketplace think? What do consumers at large respond to? And that may be very different than our own voices and our own tribal voices and community voices. Right. So that was a big learning process and for me and it still is, you know. And do you feel the shift, and I call it a shift now, a shift of how your customer or anyone views products, personal care products. I think there's been a shift because of COVID, you know, where everything around you has become more personal. Do you think that's having, your product will have an impact on that or there, that's having an impact, impact on your product? You know, whether it's the everyone product or the EO products now, I think personal care has become personal again. <laughs> Me too. It is very personal, right? Because, you know, just the um, limited amount of space and, right. and the maximum amount of time in a different way, maybe. And so our confinement in a way and our habits and just the small things seem to make more of a difference. You know, how does you just smell, you know, smell is such a, you know, you inhale something and it goes right into your, the place in your brain where it bypasses your brain really and goes right to your sort of emotional being. And especially during this time, you know, we have been ma manufacturing mostly hand soap and hand sanitizer for both brands. And a lot of things have been on sort of long-term out of stock until we could satisfy that demand. And because all of our products have this, are grounded in aromatherapy, which means, you know, best quality essential oils, so that when you smell it, it invokes um, maybe a peaceful feeling or an uplifting feeling or, and so that's become extremely important to people to have a moment or a respite in their, in their, cleaning their hands or sanitizing their hands. And, you know, it's really become sort of a clean hands, healthy people is, has emerged out of this time for us in a, in a totally different way. And those moments of like, stop and smell the roses. It's like, you know, take a pause and, you know, can you expand out and come into this moment and feel a little bit uplifted or, better for doing it and healthier, safer, you know, is integrated into um, what it is that we're making. Right. And, and, and do you feel your rebrand really speaks to that? I do. I think <clears throat> your, your rebrand before you even open it says to me, this is going to smell good. Mm -hmm. This is going to feel good. And it's, and it's going to, it's, it's going to be healthy for me. I think it's very interesting how, when you look at the rebrand, of what you've done, do you think you've met all of those requirements? I hope so. <laughs> I hope so too. I'm very optimistic. So. I'm very optimistic. Yes, I do. I you know, think a lot of the choices, again, the choices we made were really decided by the audience or by the customer. Uh, every single choice. I mean, there's a lot of hesitation, myself included. It's like, okay, is this the right decision? Uh, and Susan and I would, right. you know, the team would dialogue about it. But some of the key decisions that were made are all driven by data and, and consumer insights, uh, including, you know, the color, including the, 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 the details, including, you know, a lot of the, the, the components. So it's a co-creation with the customer because they're the ones that are out there shopping and buying against our competitors. And in the consumer insights, we also look at what they believe and think of the competitors. So we're testing them against the competitors. So we're actually really triangulating very <laughs> fine tuned. And Robert, uh, somebody, Ken O oh, asked something about typography being subjective. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll answer that later. Uh, in that question, but there is a lot of the subjectivity that is very, very, very objective and tactical. Well, well, let's, well, let's, uh, we can address that too. The most, one of the most important mm. elements of a sustainable package, or if you want to say that you're sustainable and you have concerns, is how you communicate your information. So typography can be 
subjective, right? Mm -hmm. But objectively, it must communicate clearly what is the product about. And I think that the, the uh, Everyone Products does that. It's not, it's very direct in we are doing this. And we are doing this because we're concerned about social responsibility. And we're concerned about any sustainability. So typography in, in answering maybe one of Ken's questions is very important to clearly communicate your message. The minute you start, where's the message and you start looking for it, it's not clearly communicated. Is it approachable? Will you, do you want to approach your product, you know, the product that Susan's putting out? I think the everyone new rebrand with the everyone logo making it, I think a lot friendlier, the mm -hmm. geometrics, the use of that. So right then and there you're saying, welcome to us, you know, we're approachable. So typography, is not as subjective as one thinks when you're trying to communicate a clear message. And that's part of one of the most important requirements if you want to have a sustainable package is are you communicating clearly what your message is? So I see <clears throat> you popped in, um, Robbie. Do you want to get some questions from the audience? Is that- Yes, I am, I am here to, uh, to, <laughs> to begin the audience Q&A. Um, Great. But thank you for that. And I think the, the overview that you've provided is an example that so many businesses can bring into their approach. And if they can follow even five or 10% of what right. you've brought from an ethical and responsible perspective into that process, we will transform the world. And, and learning from this is, is the key thing in helping our design community bring this type of practice into rebranding projects that may not necessarily understand the power and the impact uh, is something that is, well, is going to be a huge part of the future of the college. So uh, well, it's amazing to hear. Well, I just wanna chime in and Jose said what Jeff and Amy, they brought some very strong principles, right? Best practices to Susan. So what they've learned from the institutional companies brought to help the perhaps less institutional companies and more ethically aligned companies. So eventually, and hopefully it does work both ways. It really does, you know. It's very hard to change a company like Johnson & Johnson. It's like trying to move an aircraft carrier, like a few degrees. They're not on their, they're not light on their feet like Susan can be, right? They have, as she said, a lot of institutional systems to deal with. But even moving 5%, 10%, you start to see, you know, the, you know, maybe the osmosis is happening back and forth. What can you bring to the larger institutional companies and what can the larger institutional companies bring to, you know, the less institutional companies to push what would be considered perhaps a fairer, a more ethically concerned company. Um, but with that, so I think it works both ways, Robbie. And I think that's where we have to understand at Art Center, we, yes, we talk about, and I think, or any design school or anyone learning about design and ethics, you really have to understand where the incorporation of this happens. What are the questions that you should be asking yourself? As Susan asks herself all the time, I'm making a decision, A or B. And underneath your decision, Susan, that you're making, is always that little voice in the back of your head, right? Is this it's doing yeah. good? It's doing this, good right. and it's true. It and I think the same thing has to be allowed in education, which is why Jose probably said, oh, I can't believe you know, she's talking about this in you know, 1996. We still have to ask as educators, we have to allow those questions to be asked in, this, in, you know, in, in, in the classroom. But go ahead, Robbie, get your questions out. To so so we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through as many of these as we can. And for the deeply tactical questions, we'll, we'll save those for the follow-up next session next week, where you'll have an opportunity to go a, a bit deeper. But to, to kick off here from Robert Godwin, he, his question is, for rebranding, please describe the different focus required for the same brand on the digital experience versus the in-store experience? 
how has that digital to uh, analog divide uh, been managed in the process? Mm -hmm. That's a really that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, our digital presence for the first, I would say, you know, 20 some years was, we have a website, if people want to buy from us, great, it's set up like that. And, you know, a couple of years ago, we started to redesign, and then it just kept going and going. And I think that we always have thought about it. What does it look like on the shelf? Because that was our orientation. And <clears throat> the um, expansion of and redesign of our uh, both brands website um, gives us so much more permission to provide information as much as people want to read and also to put the product into into different contexts so that it's more relational and you can feel it and see it and have an experience that is very different than um, on shelf. And I'm really grateful for, you know, evolving into a much more omni-channel company and embracing it uh, late, but better than never. And, you know, it's, it makes quite a difference in, in terms of our approach now to, to product. It was right on time, actually. It was executed perfectly mm -hmm. on time. And just to add a little bit to that, it's two things. One, right when we started the process, uh, the website had already been started uh, at an architecture level. And a lot of, the, I made the decision not necessarily to focus as much as, because the firm that was doing the website was doing a fine job with the architecture. We knew we were gonna have to kind of reconcile it a little bit later, but the information architecture, the, the, the flow of how you buy, how the site was structured, uh, the, it's an e-commerce uh, shopping experience was the most important and I gave feedback on that. The team gave feedback on that. And it was right before COVID, which was amazing. Amazon is extremely important. So at the marketing level, like, you know, the images, the touts, the, uh, pro the components that you need to add to Amazon, there's a lot of media and content creation that occurs. And one of the very important, most important aspects of the omni-channel uh, kind of evolution of, uh, of, uh, of a company is social. So I, I told Brad early on in one of the meetings, you know, when the, the social media person was walking around, I said, she's probably the most important person in the company, you know, in general, <laughs> like just from, from, from understanding where, where things are going. And then COVID happened, which even made it even more present to that. But um, there are a lot of considerations to take when it comes to design and visual design as it pertains to that, including the package and how it shows up as a thumbnail. And interestingly enough, we tested that and we got an answer that I wasn't expecting. And we all said, okay, we agree that it mm -hmm. looks better for e-commerce this particular way, which is what the final designs that will come out in January are. That's great. So uh, and to move through these, we have about five more. So we'll, we'll try to get them all covered. Um, Ken asks, what are the materials in the current packaging? Are they all biodegradable and earth friendly? What were the challenges you faced in determining what was possible? So in the current packaging, um, it's uh, HDPE plastic, which is recyclable, but there's an, there is 50% of that plastic is um, created. So our idea is to not create any new plastic. And so that was always bothersome. And if we tried to increase that, the amount of uh, post-consumer resin, then the bottles got really dingy and mm -hmm. it was way too hard to explain or, you know, it, it was too much of a challenge. It was better to go to a different bottle that was more appealing and, you know, held our aesthetic. The, um, so, we already knew about post-consumer resin, fortunately, from um, EO. And we, we know most of what the issues are in terms of labeling and manufacturing and color matching and, and mm -hmm. so forth. So we were able to use what we knew there and then um, just align that with um, Amber. Yeah, and, and, and another um, thing for, for Ken, you have to understand when you're doing like dealing with product, you have to also take into consideration the um, formulation of your product. 
and what containers best for it to go into and how it's being used. So it's not just, oh, I have to use, I'm gonna use this plastic or no plastic or post-consumer. It goes beyond just the aesthetics of it. It has to do with the actual physical relationship between product and package too, that has to be considered. So that's a great point because essential oils are kind of finicky and depending on you know, citruses are hard on plastic and, and peppermint oil is, is also. So the combinations are there. Each essential oil has its own essence and properties and um, quirkiness and uniqueness in terms of how to combine them. And so you have to do, we have always had to do a lot of testing to make sure that um, packaging was compatible. And so that's a, another um, element of complexity to add to the whole equation. Great. And, and then uh, to continue on from a, a follow-up from Ken uh, on a different subject, what are the advantages or disadvantage of having an in-house creative team, uh, mm. particularly with regards to this process? Yeah, well, uh, fortunately, it was both in-house and not in-house because it was in-house because Jose came to us and did an amazing job at pulling sort of siloed departments together to uh, create Brand Studio. And Jeff and Amy at BK are sort of in-house and out-of-house. Just relationally, it, it felt like they were in-house, but they got their own um, design firm in Brooklyn. And so we had the best of both. I feel like, you know, people who were really well-versed in legacy, what had come before, and then some fresher and newer talent. Um, I think it's um, that in-house creative teams are depending, you know, on who's there. And also it's just, it is always good to, to get fresh ideas from the outside, however that, that works. And that's, that's been the way we've operated for years. And I think it's a real key thing in general, and this is for the designers, whether you're a student or whether you're an alum, uh, or even if you're, you know, a, a, a stakeholder or, or an executive at a company is that, you know, who the partners you want, you want to make sure that they are able to bring the team together. You don't want an external partner, uh, like an agency or someone else to feel ex too external. Agencies do understand how to behave in a way that services their client while still being external for this job. And the mentor, I have a mentor who taught me how to consult from the inside, even though whether you're an internal or in-house, it doesn't even matter, uh, but to feel part of and integrated to the team uh, who happens to actually be the person who brought me into EO, he, he, he taught me how to do that. Um, you really needed to concentrate and focus on educating the team and being very mindful of the legacy of what the team that had been there had done. So I had one-on-ones with all of them. I knew everything about what their concerns or challenges, their, their struggles. Um, we're all human. And at the end of the day, if you don't address the human aspect and you don't acknowledge it and you don't embrace uh, the people in a way that, that is uh, extremely mindful of them, uh, resources versus, you know, people say, well, resources, no, they're, they're people and they have, they have stories. So I would say the, the advantage of an in-house team is that you have retained culture and that you have retained knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have an out of, for an example, uh, a traditional outside team would not want to maintain a long-term relationship or a person or an individual. And as I told Susan, you know, I'm part of the family for life. And, you know, we, we, the relationship really matters as to how you provide value uh, in the long term. This is a really difficult type of project to do if there isn't a long term narrative or arc. And for me, that was one of the struggles, you know, uh, you know, committing to the long term aspect of this um, it, it was 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 challenging, uh, but really how to maintain that in a way that, for example, this talk and, and the ongoing conversations that occur around the project. Uh, it's a lesson for me to understand how to build relationships for the long term, regardless of, of the projects. Mm -hmm. Next. Fantastic. So uh, this takes us in a slightly different direction, 
um, and uh, maybe Gloria, you could you could start here. So Denisa is interested. Where can we learn more about the connection between sustainability and design? I'm very keen to learn more and integrate sustainability in my packaging design work, and I want to know where to start. And aside from coming to Art Center, what else would you consider? Well, first of all, I want to uh, thank Ken O has um, some of, if you just look in the chat room, uh, there are some great suggestions from uh, some of the attendees now. They're feeding us information, you know. 50 things you can do. I mean, you can just go online and I believe Susan can also contribute uh, some information to this. I think first you have to learn um, about what clearly what is, what are, are you using the right terms? That's number one. You have to clearly understand what you mean by sustainability. So I, I, I think the best thing you can do is, uh, believe it or not, a lot of you know, professional organizations, they have a lot of information online, especially packaging companies. I think they're, they'll give you a lot of information if you just look online to find out information. Incorporating it, I think the first things you have to do is ask, ask yourself the questions yourself. Why am I doing this? What is the purpose of this product I'm designing? How can I, as a designer, clearly make certain hmm, decisions about size of package to product? Um, where is it being used? What is the value of the product? I mean, there's a whole list we can go over. Robbie, you can give them my email if anyone wants more detailed information. I'm open and anyone can find me at Art Center. It's a very complex information, you know, question to ask because there's so much information out there now about packaging, product, and environmental sustainability. You don't have to come to Art Center, but I'll be glad to have a discussion with anyone who wants to have more information. If you're a designer, if you're a design student, the, the issues you should, or the questions you should be asking yourself, okay? And someone wants to know, what's my email? You can find me easily. There's one Gloria at Art Center. So Robbie, you can definitely give him my email if you want to in, in the chat room. Okay, that's fine. Um, easy to find, easy to find. So I, I, did, I know I didn't answer your question directly, but there's so many resources that you can go to. It is a, I mean, an incredible amount of resources. If you really want to learn, if you really do want to learn. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think that, you know, there's um, Will McDonough's book, Cradle to Cradle is still sort of an old time favorite. And, you know, um, so you can look at it from the, there's so many, as Gloria was saying, it's almost like you got to think about the question from the inside out, you answer the why first, and then you'll know what questions that you want to ask as, as it ripples and you know things come together, but everything from you know what's the formula, what's the vehicle, you know that you're packaging, and what are your options, and what are the options like in the marketplace, and then what are you know progressive uh, industrial designers working on, and right. you know there's so much going on now with uh, robotics and recycling that mm -hmm. will help us through some of this, you know, the plastic answers. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the um, extreme options is going back to things like bar soap or body bars or cleansers that don't require packaging or very minimal right. packaging. Right. So you have the, you know, it runs the gamut between, you know, what is the experience of using that product, you know, versus a product that, has water in it and, you know, other essential oils and botanicals and so forth. So it's a, it's a, it's always a, um, it's an evolution and it's a really paying attention to all of those, all of the questions, right? And I'm just going to add to this, Susan, because, you know, Susan and I did, we're not engineers. Okay. We didn't come to this as engineers. So those of you who are packaging designers, I don't want, or who are graphic designers, you work with a team of people who can answer questions for you, but you have to ask the right questions. Your 
expertise is communicating to your consumer what the product is about, what the package is about. Leave the engineering to the engineers, leave the manual. You can ask, the more you know, the better designer you will be. But I don't want you all of a sudden to become overwhelmed with, oh my God, I, I don't understand this process. You don't have to understand the process. You have to ask the right questions and understand where your role is in terms of the process, whether you're leading the design of something or you're, you know, you're leading the rebrand of something. As a designer, a visual communicator, you have you can ask these questions of the industrial designer, of the manufacturer. You know, don't don't worry that you don't know all the answers. It's not your responsibility. You must work with your strength as the visual communicator to make everything understood. You know, and lots of engineers, lots of industrial designers, lots of right people who will help you along in terms of developing your your brand and your packaging. Thank you. Uh, so a, a question from an anonymous attendee here. If zero waste and sustainability is at the core of your company, what can you do to continue this once the product is in the consumer's hands to prevent you know, them throwing it away or um, <clears throat> using it only once? Yeah, it's a, that's a big question. And I think that's a, you know, it's a more widespread uh, question in terms of how are we um, called as a community and society focused on reducing and reusing and recycling. And we, of course, have no control over what a person does when they bring the product into their home other than to, you know, answer questions and educate and make whatever resources available in an open system to just enhance those values and principles so that we can all um, make the contribution and do the next right thing in terms of reversing climate change. And that realizing that we're interdependent in, you know, and it's so obvious to me now more than ever that we all have to come together to uh, do what we can. I think uh, another interesting point that you ask already, you know, Susan is putting already, you know, PCR into the, you know, she's already using something that's been recycled. And so it's been out of the system and hopefully that'll go back again into the recycling of the product. And I always had a term and those who know me uh, in terms of visual communication, if it looks like garbage, it will be garbage. So the amount of respect that you have for what you bring to the market, I think is very important as well. You know, the integrity of a product that maintains its integrity, people will think twice about what happens to this. And maybe it's an inspiration how they look at other products that they have in their home, right? And say, well, maybe I can do better here in this area because this product is telling me I can do better. And that's one of the reasons that products can help educate the consumer in other products that they're using. Use one good product and then you start to question everything else you have in your home that you're using. Yeah. Well, right. That's, very, that's very true. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, also, you know, one of the portals for this is when people have children because they start to really pay attention to next generation naturally and mm -hmm. just health and safety. And so that's, that's always a, an opening. And once you sort of become educated and wanna know more, then a lot of habits change in that discovery mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's a, that's a signal of some of the strongest brands is that they encourage changing behavior even when the brand is not being used so it's not necessarily that you're washing your hands all day but the way you're thinking about that process really can start to change how you treat other things what you put into your body what you eat what you, you know mm -hmm. what car you drive any of the, the, the mm -hmm. that wide range of areas where we do have an ability to reduce or reuse or 
change our our uh, our impact. So um, I have one. I know I, there's so much more to say on that front, and there's we're never going to get through this all. But uh, I want to go back to a, a, a specific question that I think is really key in this, uh, and maybe we'll be what time for one more question after that. So it's it's from Scott, and it it says. Um, Susan mentioned the operational impact of the rebranding, changing the packaging, changing the process. Please tell us about the back and forth between mm -hmm. design and business. Uh, and where did the pushback occur? How was it resolved? And what would you do differently? So, so when were some of those tensions around price and timeline and complexity bumping up against aesthetics and package choice and, you know, the kind of ethos of what you were looking to do. So I, I alerted our COO that this was something that we were looking into very early on and he was not happy, but he was, he, he was open, <laughs> you know, because the, the job then for his team became, how do you run through all the packaging, all the contracts, everything that are already in place and change it over? And at what point for all these different uh, product categories and sizes? So, you know, that was, uh, that was the first, one of the first points of resistance. And then of course our um, CEO wanted to know how much it was going, going to cost and what it was going to do to increase revenue on the other side, which is of course an unknown. So then trying to substantiate, you know, will it increase velocity by X in Target or Whole Foods or wherever? So those are the sort of questions that we did our best to answer. And um, we, we still don't know, right? But we, we became aligned around data points, show and tell, transparency, and having a, a multi-functional uh, team from everywhere in the company to talk through this and to create that task force, which is still, we're still meeting on a still weekly ongoing. basis. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of credit, you know, Maya, you know, I remember early on Maya May, the new CMO, she started about a month and a half, two months after I did. Um, she, she was very capable in um, putting together both the agendas, but also just pushing from a, from mm -hmm. a, from a, uh, from a willpower and personality standpoint. Mm -hmm. But yes, the, the, the transparency and conversations and really being mindful. One of the reasons why we started having those parties was because I was being, you know, briefed. I have like a little headphone in my ear that we needed to expand the brand mm -hmm. studio's visibility outside of just the design team and the marketing team. So I invited everybody from the company. So the rumors started to spread around the company that, oh my God, we have a rebrand coming and <laughs> people came kind of nervous and we gave them food and we talked to them and we got to know their roles. So socializing change is super important for the change to happen. And it was a big part of it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, somebody asked this question, Robbie, and I'll just, I'm sorry to hijack it really, oh, we're at 130. I answered it via text, Krista, on the methods. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone. We will we will end promptly at 130 because we could continue this and we will in the follow-up session uh, next Monday at noon, you'll, you'll receive a, uh, there's a link in your original invitation and we will send out in our follow-up today uh, a reminder to make sure you register for that. Uh, it will be a, a, in more of an open session and you'll be able to really dive into some of these questions on process with Jose and Jeff. Um, Susan, thank you for being here for this, for sharing your practice, your wisdom, your vision for this company. Uh, I see another 50 years ahead of continued <laughs> profit and growth and a model that we can really learn from that can be applied to different contexts um, you know, as we develop the business models of the future. And I think design's role in that is taking a, a real leadership position and, and helping companies make these leaps because it's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. So Gloria, thank you for hosting us. Jose, we, we really appreciate your, 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 your wisdom and your insights and the way that you have 
elevated. What Susan is doing with the team is incredible. So this is an example of so much of what Art Center uh, offers the world right. and proud for, for us all to be here for that and to see where this takes us. So we'll follow up next time. We'll send a survey. You'll receive more information uh, about today's uh, follow up on Monday. Uh, and please keep in touch. We're, we are working hard to bring more programs like this to you uh, in the future. So thank you. And thank you, Robbie. Mm -hmm. um, thanks all, thank such you. a pleasure to be with yeah, you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you everyone. It's, it's, it's great, it's been wonderful. It's been our pleasure. Thank you everyone for coming too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gloria, thank you, Susan. Hope to see, see you everyone soon. Next week. Okay. Yeah, see you next week. Bye.